Kia ora. Turn to your neighbor and say, Kia ora, te whanau. <laughs> no my hurry my to everybody and guess if you're here. Thank you. Uh, if you're here uh, for the first time or second time, welcome. My name is Richard. I'm um, one of the pastors here. I follow Jesus and try to help others find and follow Jesus, which is very, very good. So, yep, I went over to Hawaii with Josh Ui. Where's Josh? Oh, you're, Josh, you're right there, kind of hiding behind the camera. So Josh and I were over there, and it was really great to travel together. And we really wanted to put some significant resource as a church behind our youth ministry. Can we give it up for youth? Yeah. You know when you've got kids and youth uh, pumping and happening, you know you've got your future so solid, right? And so uh, we want to invest in Josh as a ministry. We're so proud of him and Kat and the team and what they're doing in our youth ministry. So it's all about going to another level and how can we even grow that even more and just have fun doing that. Is it okay to have fun and do ministry as well? Yeah, yeah, I just need to have more fun in my life. Not only girls have fun, but guys can have fun too. I've got Cindy Lauper popping in my head right now. Wow, it's great. Um, it's crazy. I was in, can you believe it? I was in Honolulu, Hawaii, for a week. It was torturous. Everywhere you go, there's water, but I couldn't go in it. You couldn't, we were so locked into meetings and a tight schedule, we didn't even go onto the beach. Now, I think that is actually sinful. <laughs> Forgive me, Father, if I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, it's ridiculous. Anyway, we made it back, and it's really, really good. And there's something I noticed. As we went through the airport of Auckland and then into the USA, I mean, USA, man, they know what security's like, right? Like, ch -ch -ch, those guys, they, they've got everything locked down. I notice when we go through, there's one thing that airports and airlines want from you, besides your money. <laughs> there's one thing that they want besides your money, whether, whether it's your first flight, your last flight, whether you're with a group or you're on your own, whether you're kind of a newbie, whether you're old or young or whatever your culture is or your marital status or your social economic status. There's one thing that they want, one thing they want to know. Do you know what it is? Neither do I. No, just joking. <laughs> just joking. What they want to know is if you're being honest. It's interesting and staggering, actually, when you think about it. Just got my list here. When you go to check in, you've got to, make, you've got to affirm all kinds of statements, you know, what you're carrying and what you're not carrying. And I am the said person in the passport. You've got the whole check-in process and, and the contents of your bags. And, and then you go along and they weigh the scales on the bag to, to make sure it's within a certain range or not above a certain weight. And then you come to immigration and the passport. There's multiple checks all the way through. And they even inspect your carry-on baggage. And if you've got a laptop, you've got to take all your digital devices out and choose off when you're coming out of the year. Everywhere along the way, there's check-ins all the time. And then you're bored. This gets me, actually. You're in the board. You get through all of that. You're in your gate. You're waiting there. You're chilling out, right? And then they want you to board, and they call the names, and they check you in, of course. You've got to scan your boarding pass. You know what I'm talking about. This always cracks me up, actually. So you have, you've got, got through all of this. You've all, they've already got, they slip off a part of your boarding pass. They check and look at your face and your photo, and you all realize the passport always looks better. And you get to the airline, and they want to see your boarding pass again. Now, that always strikes me, like, do you think I can't find 42D? I can't go anywhere. It's an airplane. 42 is between 41 and 43. You get all the way there, and that's just getting out of the country. And then you get to the other end, and you've got all of that pretty much in reverse. All kinds of security checks. Why are there so many checks? Now, I'm glad that they do it, but there's so many. It's like they almost expect people to be dishonest to conceal, to record and report and say things that are not actually correct, to misrepresent the truth. Let me ask you a question. Are you an honest person? Let me ask another question. Are you being honest now? We 
are going to drop into a biblical story where God is dead serious about truth and honesty. Another word for that is lying. Let's just rewind the tape a little bit. Here we have, right there at the beginning of the book of Acts, as we are going through the book of Acts here, we have the very first church ever being established. It was budding. It was, it was like around about 10,000 people, maybe give or take a few more, and they're growing in spirit, they're growing in number, they're growing in their faith, they're growing in love and power. It's like the sap of the spirit is empowering the bud to expand and stems and leaves are unfoiling as the branches begin to extend and flowers pop out and grow. There's boldness and unity and miracles are also happening with persecution as well. All kinds of amazing things are taking place in this brand new, this is not a church plant from a mother church, this is the church, this is the OG, this is like the blueprint, this is the original gangster. There was no Christian denominations before this, no Catholic, Protestant, Eastern, Orthodox, no Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, or good old charismatic Pentecostals. This was the very beginning of the church of Jesus. And God wanted to make sure there was absolute purity in the formation of the foundations of his body, the church. In early 20th century English pastor, author, evangelist, a wonderful, brilliant man called George Morgan. He highlights the importance of this embryotic moment in church history. And he says, this was a critical juncture for the early church. And such impurity, sin, scandal, and satanic infiltration could have corrupted the entire church at its roots. The church has never been harmed or hindered by opposition from without. It has been perpetually harmed and hindered by perils from within. And sadly, something shocking is about to strike the church for the very first time in our story today. One of the major features, as Shandy so well preached last week, one of the major features of this early church can you believe it? Miracle upon miracles, church members were parting with their hard-earned money to help other people. People willingly sold property and lands and brought the money to the feet of the apostles who were and are the representatives of God. They were freely selling it, freely giving away funds so the church leaders could share as everybody had need. Nobody lacked. There's a deep sense of awe, this fresh, new, burgeoning, phenomenal, miraculous body of people were functioning like the kingdom of God, new and filled with promise and potential. And one particular church meeting, maybe it looked like this, I don't think so, but it was a gathering of the people. It was the ecclesia. One particular meeting there's a particular chap called Joseph, and some people prefer to call him Barnabas or Barney, maybe. And this particular chap, he, he brought his entire proceeds to the front of the altar and put it, as it says, at the feet of the apostles. And he was recognized for his gift. And in that meeting, in the presence of God, in that powerful gathering, thousands of people must have been there Everyone's watching, but within the crowd, one man hears the accolades that Barnabas is receiving. He saw the admiration he received for this very generous gift, and something rose up within his heart. His name was Ananias. Something rose up in his heart, and he thought, I want some of that. I want some praise. I want some likes on my post. And he devised a secret plan, but the secret is eventually exposed in a dramatic way. And that is the background to our text. And so I'm going to ask you, if you wouldn't mind, if you're able, to stand to your feet as we read Acts chapter 5, 
verse 1 through 11. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife, Sapphira, sold some property. He brought much or part, sorry, of the money to the apostles, claiming it was a full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you seen let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone heard about it, was terrified. Then some young men got up and wrapped him in a sheet and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, Was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied. That was the price. And Peter said, How could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the Spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. Wow. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. God blessed the reading of his word. You may take a seat. I want to call this talk, surprise, surprise, truth exposed. We've got this interesting story, wouldn't you say? Now we could stand here and give you a two-second sermon and simply say, don't lie, and then we'll go home. But that would do disservice to the text because I'm sure there are many questions. The first thing we should notice is the very first word, but. That connects a conjunction. It connects us to Barney, Barnabas, the guy just before. Now we have this contrast. We have Barney giving all his money, the sale he had. He brought it to the church. And then we have the contrast. We have the positive and we have the negative. We've, by the way, got three Ananiases in the New Testament. So this is not the same Ananias as the guy who discipled the great apostle Paul. There are three Ananiases there, and we're in a public meeting right here, and the story actually strangely feels very much like Achan back in Joshua 7. Do you remember that one, where they were told not to take anything from the pagans, and he took some gold, there we go, praise God, and he put the gold in the ground and he hid it? Can you remember that story? Okay, come back. I'm not sure we really need lights because I'm pretty white anyway. <laughs> now, I can say that, right? That's how God made me. So Ananias, he brings in this, what I would call a spectacular gift. He just kept a part of it for himself. You try selling a property in Auckland, let's call it a million dollars. You know, he kept a bit back, but he brought in a pretty massive gift, didn't he? Just imagine. And he expected praise, but he's stunned to receive a rebuke. A very public rebuke, which is a great lesson for a leader. When someone does sins publicly, you rebuke them publicly. When they sin privately, you do it private. This is very public, like thousands of people in front of the only original church. Peter gets a supernatural word of knowledge. The Holy Spirit speaks to him, and he drops, and he draws his last breath, and they do it on repeat for his wife, Sapphira, or Sapphira. Now, I want to get to the main point, and I'm going to get to that very soon, but I just have to make a few little observations on the way through. The first one is regarding wives. You notice that this sin was conspired in the heart of Ananias, but she went along with it. And actually, Peter asked her, she, gave, she actually had another opportunity. And I just want to say this. Yes, we believe that wives submit to their husbands, but they don't submit to sin. If your husband's ladies are sinning and he asks you to be a part of it, say no. Go with God. That's good wisdom right there. Submission does not include sin. 
And so the expectation of the apostles was that Sapphira would come clean and go, well, actually, no, it's a silly idea anyway. But she lied. She had an opportunity. So girls, wives, women, want to be wives? You don't submit to your husbands when it comes to sin. Second thing I want to observe is instant death. This is interesting, like, whoa! Now, most scholars believe that actually the exposing of the moment the, in front of so many people was so shocking that they actually had a cardiac arrest. Most scholars would say that I consulted a bunch of them. Some would say it was simply an act of divine judgment. But either way, he brought it upon himself. And let's move on to the burial, because I thought this was really interesting. Immediately they got buried, right? Like no funeral, no eulogy, no tears, no nice flash song. No Celine Dion moment, you know, nothing like that. Just, just no goodbyes. Like, I mean, are they parents? Have they got kids? Are they, have they got siblings? Nephews, nieces? I mean, they're part of a tight-knit community. I'm sure they had neighbors and people that they kept on washing, washing their clothes with or drawing water at the communal well. I mean, nothing like that at all. Their body's still warm and they bury him. Now, some suggest that they couldn't actually contact Sapphire and maybe because... Believe it or not, there was a time where there were no cell phones, people. Young people, they were, you can live without a cell phone. But I find them very helpful myself. But there was a time that if somebody was away, there was no real way of communicating with them. Some suggest that the burial happened because of the very hot eastern conditions. There's no refrigeration back then, so that demanded an immediate burial to save the spread of disease. Or for other reasons unknown, they couldn't contact his wife. We're not really sure. But I think the author's lack of detail is the point. The point is not to focus on the detail of the burial, but to focus on the cause of the whole thing. The big question for me is why, oh why, did he do it? Why? Why? Can everybody say why? 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 Why did you do it? This is completely unnecessary. There was no guilt trip. There was no manipulative marketing machine from the oversight and the leadership. It was completely free will, no pressure from the apostles. It was completely up to them to do what they wanted to do as the Spirit moved them. They could have used their money for all kinds of things. I mean, like you, you could sell your property. They could have done the same thing. They could have bought themselves a brand new Tesla or maybe a, get iWatches for all the whānau. They maybe did a 10-night luxury cruise around the Mediterranean. They could do whatever they wanted to do with their money. And yes, you can give some to the church. The sin was not that they kept some money to themselves. The sin was that they lied to God. Interesting. I can only imagine Ananias, you know, having a bit of a smirk on his face. If he lived in Auckland, sell the property for a million dollars, let's just say, hmm, he keeps nine hundred thousand I mean he keeps a hundred thousand dollars. He walks up to the front with a nine hundred thousand dollar check and puts it down. You know, he walks up real slow just to make sure nobody misses it. Maybe he wore some nice perfume and cologne and his favorite bright pink shirt. I don't know. Just so he could have that moment of glory and put down a $900,000 check. He expected praise just like Joseph or Barnabas. Zero. Nothing. The Holy Spirit speaks through Peter and says, you've lied because you claimed it was the whole thing. It was completely unnecessary. And not to mention our man Ananias had seen all that happened in Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. He'd seen the miracles, seen the supernatural provision. He'd seen the outbreak of the gospel moving through that place. It was undeniable for any sensible, sane observer that God was present. Things were happening. It was amazing. God was moving. He was alive, but he wanted praise. He wanted to keep a little for himself, a little bit like Judas. He wanted to inflate 
his spiritual image to others who are watching. It's like some people, they don't really live like Christians, but they pop up the occasional scripture on IG. Or they pop along to church, but their heart's really not even here. Or they, leave, they make sure they leave that big Bible, that big old Bible that would choke a mule. You put that big old Bible on the front of a dining table. So you're walking, oh, you're a believer in Jesus. Oh, yes. I don't know about you, but for me, this story begs the question, do I imitate this sin today? Maybe you could ask that question. Do I try to pretend a spiritual image when in reality it's something very different? Do we create or allow the impression that we are people that read our Bible and pray, but we're really not? Or we're a person that has it all together when we really don't? Or do we exaggerate our spiritual accomplishments and effectiveness to appear like something we're not? It's like those people that, you know, use those filters on their photos to make their lips a bit fuller and their teeth a bit wider and their skin a little less blemished. Do we do that spiritually? Honestly, there have been times that I've gone away from conversations, even sermons, and the Holy Spirit said, Richard, that's not really what happened. It wasn't quite like that. We're so good, aren't we, at making the good stuff, just giving it a bit of a beef up by 10%, and then just kind of taking the bad stuff down 10%. Do you know what I mean? I mean, can we be honest? We're in church, number one. Number two, we're talking about the text today. It's about this exact thing. I have done it on a regular basis. And the Holy Spirit convicts me. Saying, Richard, it wasn't quite like that. Are you happy with the image of spirituality without the reality of it? You know, we give those pet Christian answers, don't we? Questions are raised, and maybe in a connect group, maybe just in casual conversation, maybe in church or some ministry you're serving, and questions, you know, inquiries are made, and we just do the pet answer, but we have zero intention of living like that. We say we trust God, but do we? We say we tithe, but do we? Giving $10, and it's not a tithe unless you earn $100 for that period of time. And of course, on occasion, it may be more blatant than that. We may just straight out lie to others because you think that's what they want to hear or you think that's going to make you look good in front of them. And we can lie to God. which is kind of an oxymoron. Honesty isn't just a good virtue. It's a divine command. It's a decree. It's a mandate. Jesus never lied. And we follow him. American pastor, leader, missionary, preacher. He preached over 13,000 sermons, wrote over 50 books. His name's Arthur Pearson. He offers these sobering words. Listen to it. As much as anything, the lesson of Ananias and Sapphira is that we presume greatly on God when we assume that there's always time to repent, time to get right with God, time to get honest with Him. Any such time given by God is an undeserved gift that we owe to, He owes to no one. We should never assume it will always be there. The solitude example of Ananias and Sapphira must stand as a lasting and terrible monument of what God thinks of that sin. That's why honesty is not just a good virtue. It's a divine command. I am the way, the truth, and the life, said Jesus. 
Can we just learn to be plain honest, ladies and gentlemen? Why are we so dishonest in our attempts to impress other people? Why do we feel that we can't be completely open and honest? What is it in our soul, as it was with Ananias, that wants to deceive others so they would think highly of us? Is it shame? Shame of the truth? Is it unworthiness? Is it guilt? Dishonesty in attempts to seek glory and impress others often stems from a a mix of insecurity and comparison and the desire for acceptance. And if you actually manage to impress others, we all know it doesn't work because it's based on a lie. It's fake. But here is the thing. Only Jesus can give you and I real security and true acceptance. Are we looking to people for something that they can't give? I embrace this what seems to be a pursuit of authentic relationship. I think the world is asking for the church to have more integrity, to be more truthful, and to be authentic in its journey of faith. Rather than this clean, sterile, perfect looking image that we want to present. And this starts with me. Now, I get it. You don't go and say everything to everyone. You've got to measure, you've got to have diplomacy and wisdom. I I get that. But it should always be within the bounds of truth and honesty. Always. Can someone say amen to that? Psalm 122, verse 6 and 7 says, May they be secure who love you, Lord. Peace be within these walls and security within your towers. Which is why we need to be really honest with God. It starts, I believe, with being honest with God and not being like Ananias. The story we just read this morning is an uppercut. It's a wake-up call. Because sometimes so-called white lies and embellishments and dilution of the truth has crept into our lives. And we Christians can be the worst among them. How are you with God? Honestly. How's your relationship with God? What is the truth of your relationship with God? I wonder if like Ananias, you're holding something back. I did that for years, living a double life, holding something back. It wasn't just a little bit either. It was probably 50%. One thing in church and another life outside of church. And the time came when I was willing to admit the truth of my heart and the truth of my condition. And I felt in that moment the pleasure of God as we now could have a real conversation without me trying to hide and blow it off and make it out as if it was anything more than it was. Truth. It's so freeing, isn't it? To have honest conversations. What's separating you and God? Do you want to stop hiding, stop pretending? God wants to restore honesty and truth to the church. The story happens in the church. It's time we took sin seriously. And it starts with us. It starts with me. 
Ephesians 1, chapter 4 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be, everyone say it, holy and blameless. But we can't do that. We can't do it in our own strength. We need God to help us. We need Jesus, the one who lived perfectly to help us in this hour. I don't know about you, but I have in times gone past asked God to restore my conscience because I was able to do things which I knew intellectually was not right, but I didn't feel anything. My heart had become numbed and calloused. Does anyone else know what I feel like? When you're so intentional and so going to do it and ignore God, he says, okay, go ahead. And you do it enough and then your heart becomes uh, senseless. It becomes numb to it. The moment happens later on, you wake up and go, Wow, how did I even get to that point? God, restore my conscience. Make it clean. Make it sensitive. Make it free. Lord, let me not go with the crowd. Let me not live like some fake Christian. Let me live authentically and real with you. I wonder if anyone else here today would have that cry in their heart. I'm, pr I'm praying that now. Lord, forgive me. For, help me not to pretend to be a pastor or somehow give this impression that there might be a, 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 there's no errors in my life and no sin. There is, friends. Nothing known, nothing grievous, but little things are popping up and little things are being repented of every week. And I walk in relationship and accountability because I know Left to my own devices, I will de-escalate my sin and escalate the image of something that is not real. Is anybody hearing me today? It says in the text that Satan filled Ananias' heart, but here we go. Satan couldn't do his sinning for him. Satan may fill our heart. He may conceive an idea. James tells us this as well, but he needs our cooperation. We are not without choice. So don't give me excuses. Oh, sorry. Don't give God excuses. Oh, it's just the way I was raised. Oh, I have this propensity and pre I have compassion for some of those things, but there's still choice involved. And we can choose not to. And there are people in this room who have chosen not to. I don't want to steal anything away from Izagani's sermon in a couple of weeks' time on the other side of Father's Day, but it's pretty obvious to me that we see, as a result of this moment, we see another layer and level of revival. Like God's moving powerfully. In fact, my dear friends, any, just a cursory look at historical revivals has always proceeded by a sweeping of the Spirit of God upon the church to repent of sin. I don't know about you, but I want and need, we need revival in this nation. And it starts with the church. It starts with our church if necessary. Maybe it has to start with Richard Urban. But can I tell you, just going and reading on and see what God does, it's beautiful salvations and healings and breakthrough and deliverance and dead being raised and churches being planted and oh society's changing crimes decreasing oh children aren't being killed i mean all kinds of social beautiful things are being reversed as god's church rises up based on truth the church is a pillar of truth or should be meanwhile we've got pews and rows filled with people being fake It's a pretty strong thing to say, but I think, nevertheless, I think it's true. There's some very sad examples. I think God is cleaning up. Just in June when I was in Manila for a couple of weeks, I learned of three megachurch pastors who fell morally or stood themselves down because of sin. Could it be... God is removing after a gracious season and time. They didn't drop dead like Ananias, but after a gracious season of time, the lies could not continue because his bride must flourish and things are exposed. 
these horrible examples of deception and deceit in senior places of the church. And I pray that that would never visit us. Nobody who tells lies enters heaven. Revelation 21, 8. Uh, Revelation 21, 27. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It's all through the scripture. The immoral people, the liars, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. It's a serious issue. And it's a serious sermon today. It's a tough sermon to bring. They won't enter heaven unless we ask for forgiveness and repent of telling lies. I wonder today as I try to wrap this thing up whether you would join me in your heart to pray the words of David in Psalm 139, 23 to 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts, my anxious thoughts. Point out anything that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. You see, David knew that honesty wasn't just a virtue. It is a divine command. God wants to lead you, friend, into greater fruit and greater health in your soul. He wants to lead you into places that are unbelievably joyful and peaceful. But we've got to start with truth and honesty. God wants your life to become and my life to become more fruitful, to multiply and reach the nations and reach people and reach your neighbors with the gospel. But what, and this is what happens when you walk authentically with God and truthfully before Him. What happens is the opposite to what happened to Ananias. We don't die, we become revived. We see truth. And honesty. And that leads to signs and wonders and healings and souls and victory and growth. So it's time, as I conclude the sermon, it's time to get honest with God if you want to. I appeal to you today. That your sin, as with my sin, is not too great for the grace of God. This gift called repentance is what we need. If that's you today, you say, Pastor, the truth is that I have a problem with lying. The truth is that the whole truth is not told. The truth is it gets twisted. It gets, you know, I want to impress people. I want to be seen in a certain way. If that's you today and you want to repent of dishonesty, maybe some of you in this room are actively, knowingly involved in dishonest endeavors. I appeal to you to stop it to repent and turn. And if you do that sincerely from your heart, God will forgive you. And then you need to go and stop whatever you were doing. Some husbands in this room could be dishonest with their wives and wives to husbands. Maybe it said, I'm getting a bit older, but I just haven't got time to muck around and be fake anymore. <laughs> God's arms are open. Will you respond? Don't be like Ananias. Don't lie. Be real. Be authentic. Let's close your eyes. If that's you and you feel to some measure convicted, you feel, wow, you're talking to me, pastor. 
I want to get right. I want to repent. Then I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer after me. I'm going to pray a prayer. I've written it down here. And I'm going to pause in between each line. And you can just pray in your heart. Just pray this prayer after me in your heart. Let's pray. I come before you in the name of Jesus and ask for forgiveness of my sins. Forgive me for all the lies I have told anybody. Forgive me for hiding my sins from you and covering up with excuses, thereby grieving the Holy Spirit whom you sent to be my guide and comforter. Forgive me also for the lies I tell myself, thereby opening the doors for the devil to attack my mind and body. Teach me to speak the truth always and to be honest with you and others at all times. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, I'm glad to tell you today that God has forgiven you and he's cleansed you and he's taken that sin and he's cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. Isn't he a good God?